Yep, hang on, I've got a problem here. Take your time. Never fails. Okay, I'm having a technology challenge. I have to fix real quick. Let's call yes, sir. Okay, sir, you should be all set. Oh, there we go. All right, thank you. Uh, I'm Mike Sullivan. I'm chair of the audit and finance committee. I call this meeting to order. This meeting is the audit and finance committee meeting of the board of trustees Lone Star College system. It's being conducted via WebEx. Today's date is May 27th. The time is 1 p.m. Call the order uh, meeting to order. I'm sorry, uh, Helen, did y'all hear the Pledge of Allegiance? I'm sorry, I think I may have still been mm -hmm. muted. Um, I did not hear it, sir. Okay, then let's, for the record, let's stand and do the Pledge of Allegiance. My apologies. How about our guest, Greg? You wanna unmute and do the Pledge of Allegiance for us, please, sir? Would you mind just the U.S. Pledge? Sure. There you go. Thank you, sir, go ahead. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible and independent. Um, liberty and justice for all. For liberty and justice for all. Sorry, I've only been to about 100 of these and got tripped up. That is okay, thank you. Uh, we don't do the Texas Pledge, we'll just go ahead and proceed. Next item on the agenda is certification of the posting of the workshop, Helen Flaherty. Yes, Chair Sullivan, I certify that the meeting was posted in accordance with the law. Okay, thank you. Next item on the agenda, public comment. Helen, has anyone signed up to speak? Uh, nobody has signed up to speak today. Okay, is there anyone who has joined the meeting who would like to sign up to speak? Um, no, that was me, not you. Thank you. Okay. Um, no one has spoken. Uh, thank you, we'll move forward then. Next agenda item is consideration of approval and acceptance of the three issue of the 2020 comprehensive annual financial report and updated independent auditors reports. And before we do that, I'd like to welcome trustee Iris Wilson, who has been on the call since the beginning. Uh, welcome trustee. Thank you. Hello. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, Ms. Mott, the floor is yours. And let's go ahead and unmute, please. Yep, need to do that. Thank you very much, trustees. I appreciate your time today. Uh, there is a presentation because uh, first we have uh, Weaver presenting and then I have a presentation. Oh, I just know we can't see those slides at the moment. You can't see the slides at the moment? No. Okay, good. I was wondering about that. I had another problem and I was just trying to flow along. So let me do some quick fixing. How's that sound? Yes, sir. You can always count on one thing. Okay, how are we now? We uh, can see the slides. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Oh. All right. Uh, well, my name is Greg Peterson. I'm the audit partner with Weaver. And I just want to do a quick presentation over the reissuance and some of the communications that we're uh, required to make as part of this reissuance. Uh, Link, if you can go ahead and flip to the next slide. Uh, actually, let's go ahead and let's flip to the next one. I wasn't sure which order we'd be going in, uh, me and Jennifer. So uh, it might do uh, a bit of good here if we kind of do a little bit of a background and talk about what is causing this reissuance. Um, so the reason we're having this reissuance is because of a misstatement uh, related to improperly expensing 
a deferred outflow related to your post-employment benefit plan. Um, and what this error in this amortization did was cause an overstatement of OPEB expense of about $83 million in the previously issued financial statements. Um, and as part of this, uh, this error, uh, we'll have to reissue the financial statements and we'll, we'll flip back to the summary table here in a bit and we'll talk about how that uh, affects the report and some of our required communications. Um, but just kind of to the point, further to the point of, you know, this error being identified by the college uh, related to this uh, overstatement of expense. So when we're looking at this and we're thinking about, you know, what, what would cause, like, what were the reasons for not identifying this error? I'd like to point out just a, a few points, I think, that, you know, kind of help us with understanding how this could have happened. Uh, so the first point is really when we're talking about OPEB, we have to think about how sensitive the OPEB balances are um, in relation to uh, other balances in the financial statements. So your OPEB is really all determined based on actuarial calculations. And when these actuaries are doing their calculations, they can make some very small changes in their estimates that can lead to some very significant changes in the plan. So when we see this number of you know, $83 million overstatement of expense, I mean, it, it sounds like a very large number, but we almost have to kind of put that into context with the other OPEB related balances. Um, so these balances, you know, the OPEB liability itself is almost a $200 million number. Um, so when these actuaries make these small changes in their estimates, it can lead to very, very significant changes. Therefore, it kind of masks you know, any kind of mechanical error in the calculations themselves almost get masked just because of the sensitivity involved in these calculations. Um, so, you know, so an $83 million overstatement, you know, when looking at it from a hair, very high picture, you know, it doesn't seem that unusual. Um, you know, there's a, a lot of disclosures in the actual financial statements themselves related to this sensitivity of these OPEP calculations. Um, just one off the top of my head that I can think of is a, a change in a discount rate determined by the actuaries can actually have like a $70 million swing in your OPEB um, liability. A 1% change in expected healthcare costs can have a $70 million swing in your OPEB liabil liability. So, so when we're looking at this in the context of an $83 million error, you know, we have to think about it in you know, in context with, you know, very small changes can really lead to, uh, to large changes in the financial statements themselves. The next point I'd like to make is the complexity of the standard itself. Um, so GASB 75 was issued or was effective in fiscal year 2018. Um, and that's really when we first put that large liability on the books um, was back in 2018. Um, and over the years, what's happened between 2018 and, and 2020, there's been this element that has been included into the calculation for this OPEB, and that's referred to as the change in proportionate share, which is uh, the piece of this um, calculation that we had the error in, was this change in proportionate share. So the change in proportionate share didn't actually show up until FY19, and then in FY20, was the first year that we actually had to start amortizing this 2018-2019 um, layer of this expense. So uh, we kind of have to put it into context of, you know, we have multiple layers of this, uh, this change in proportionate share, and each one of these layers has to be amortized over a specific period. Well, what happened was this was the first year a prior layer had to be amortized, um, and obviously that that amortization happened, but then the remaining balance got expensed, leading to this eighty three million dollar error. I know that's a lot, and it's kind of hard to see, uh, you know, comprehend without some type of visual. But we just have to keep that in context that for this FY twenty year, we had this new element to this already very complicated calculation. Uh, I don't know if you've had a chance to review any of the colleges 
work papers or calculations of this uh, of these OPEB balances, but it's a very very complicated calculation. Um, you know, it's hundreds of inputs over multiple tabs uh, within an Excel file to help us calculate what these OPEB balances should be. Um, and unfortunately, what what happened was that one of the, a piece of this input uh, wasn't made correctly, causing the the overstatement of expense. Uh, further to that point, you know, ERS is the organization that oversees this plan, this OPEP plan. And ERS did not provide a timely template for the college to use and implement for this calculation, which just further put this already complicated calculation more um, in the hands of the college versus, you know, the organization that oversees the plan that hires the actuaries to come in and do these calculations, uh, that information just was not provided timely, which also led to uh, this misidentification. Uh, Link, if you could go ahead and flip to the next slide. So, so as a result of this, um, of this $83 million error, we're going to reissue the financial statements. We are going to dual date the auditor's report. And we're also going to have included material weakness and internal controls. So through our conversations with Jennifer and her team, you know, we, we agree that these financial statements, they do, they do need to be you know, restated because of the dollar amount of the error, but also because of uh, the folks, those third parties that are actually relying on these financial statements. Um, and, I, and I do want to mention that, you know, once this error was identified, the college did remove the report from, from their website to limit any other third parties from downloading the original financial statements because um, we didn't we didn't want people to rely on, on those financial statements when we know we're going to have a reissuance. Um, and we've also spoken to Jennifer and her team, and they're going to resubmit this reissued financial statements to third parties like the grantors, any bond rating agencies, uh, any any agencies that are required to receive a submission of this audit will be sent uh, this corrected financial statements. Um, and the other part is the the newly addition material weakness. So our auditing standards basically require us that if we have a material misstatement that's not identified within the entity's internal controls, that we have to communicate a material weakness. So that will be uh, one of the new communications that are included in this updated financial statements. However, we've we've already talked to Jennifer and we've already basically they put into place a corrective action plan uh, to ensure that this type of error doesn't happen again. Um, and I, I completely agree. This is one of those errors that only happens once. Um, you know, you we now know where the issue is related to that amortization. We know how to correct that going forward. I've already seen that within their calculations that this piece um, is going to be corrected going forward. So I don't really foresee, you know, this being a recurring material weakness. Uh, this is one of these one-time misstatements that we get fixed, we, re we reissue, and, and we just move forward. Um, let's see here. So when it comes to dual dating the report, so what exactly that means is when we issued our original financial statements, you know, in our opinion, we say, you know, we performed this audit in accordance with auditing standards, so on and so forth. We issued an unmodified opinion, which we are still issuing an unmodified opinion. And we dated that as of December 21st, 2020. Well, what dual dating requires us to do is come in and now we're going to add a date to that. So our audit opinion is going to be dated December 21st and it will be dated June 3rd or yeah, June 3rd, uh, specific to this one correction of this error. So that's the dual dating piece. So everything other than this, this one correction is going to be dated December 21st. This one correction is going to be dated June 3rd. So, so what that lets the users know is that, you know, we're only we're reissuing because of this this one correction of an error. It does not our audit procedures are not extended from December 21st through June 3rd. We were good with the numbers as they were as of December 21st. We're just reissuing for for this one additional change. So that's that's really what the dual dating implies. Um, is just just limiting our report and our opinion to uh, this additional correction of the error. If we can, let's go ahead and move forward one slide. 
Can I ask the question before we keep going? This is Trustee sure. Ayers Wilson. Um, now you mentioned that ERS didn't provide the template in a timely manner. How often does this happen, and how do how can how can we make sure this doesn't happen again? Because eighty three million, it might not seem like a lot when you're looking at it from what you said two hundred million or whatever, but eighty three million is almost a hundred million, which is almost half. So we we don't want to make that like a minute number, a small number. We want to make sure that these errors, these type of errors, don't happen again. So how can we, how, how often do they not get these templates to whoever they need to get to? And how can we ensure that this doesn't happen again? Thank you. Absolutely. So Jennifer, you may want to jump in on this one, but I, I, I believe that this is the first year that ERS has even provided a template uh, for the members of the plan. Uh, no, so it was sort of the reverse is the first two years ERS provided this entire calculation to us. This was the first year that they stopped doing that and we needed to do the calculation ourselves. Um, but so from here on going forward, we now have our own template. We have now built our own workbook. That's part of the collective action plan that I have that you'll see in my slides is we will no longer be dependent upon ERS providing us a template. We now have our own workbook to do the calculations. So that's what we've done there. Ms. Harris Wilson, any comment? No, I, that, that's what I wanted to know because you know we don't we 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 don't want any costly mistakes. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So just trying to I'm just trying to get some understanding about you know how you know how often this happened and you know we want to make sure this doesn't happen again. So it's glad to know we have our own template and not going to rely on somebody else to do something for us that we should be doing on our own. Yes, so we will still be dependent upon ERS to provide us to provide us some of the inputs, the, the actuarial reports and things like that from ERS. But yeah, now we have the template that does the actual calculation. So if they are untimely in providing us inputs, I mean, that will know and have to um, find a solution to, but it's not an error then in the calculations, right? It'll just be known if we don't have the figures yet to do the calculation. Um, so that's where we would still be dependent, but yeah, we now have the workbook are on our own. But do they not have do they not have a deadline to get this to us? I mean, we you know, you know what I'm saying? You don't want to just leave it to somebody else's, you know, time frame. Okay, well, y'all said this day, but we can't get it like that. So are we not giving them what they need in order to come up with this in a timely fashion, or is it just they're just not being able to get it? You know, yeah. won't be able to get it in a timely fashion. Do you know? The inputs that we receive from them is not dependent on anything they need to get from us. They are the ones who administer the entire plan. So in that sense, we would be dependent on them getting us those inputs um, because we don't have, they're not waiting on us for anything. We don't have access to any of that. They're the ones who administer the plan. But are we giving them a deadline is what I'm trying. I guess that's what I'm trying to find out. So we we're not having to wait on anybody do they have a specific deadline from Lone Star from your office to say hey we need this by this date in order for you all to do your job you, you know what I'm saying is there like a cutoff time you know and if not then we need to get that established I will check on that I mean honestly all community colleges everyone who participates in the ERS plan would need the same thing yes yeah and, and so just to clarify so when, when I was talking about a delay so ERS provides the community colleges, all participants within this plan, uh, other state organizations that participate in this plan, you know, they provide the actuary information. Uh, and as Jennifer mentioned, you know, this was the first year that they didn't provide assistance with the calculation of this change in proportionate share. So that's the piece that ERS wasn't as timely in providing is how do we go? How do the users of this calculate this change in proportionate share? And then the future amortization of that. So that's that's the piece that that they were a little late on providing. But uh, as Jeffrey mentioned as well, the, the college now has its own template that it's going to use going forward. Uh, again, we've reviewed it. Absolutely agree with all the inputs and the and the formulas within the calculation. Uh, and and you also mentioned that the the eighty three million dollar number being a large number, which I completely agree with. Uh, again, I just want to mention that this eighty three million dollar expense 
you know, I want to make sure that we understand that it's not really like this 83 million doesn't result in a use of cash or a loss of cash. This is purely like a, a book loss. You know, this is a book expense that doesn't result in loss of cash. So it's, we don't owe someone this $83 million. We didn't overspend this $83 million. This is a, a non cash expense. So I just want to make sure that, that we're all on the same page with that as well. That's understandable, but it's still an overstatement. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Regardless if it's going out or staying in house, you know, that's a, that's a, it was still overstated. And so I just, you know, I'm just trying to understand um, and try to get some, get some understanding and, and see how, what other processes we have in, in place, you know what I'm saying? To make sure, sure. this doesn't happen again, because it can be a one-off and it, and it cannot be a one-off. So, you know, we just want to make sure that, you know, everything is going to be done the way it needs to be done without any delay. Absolutely. Yeah. And I, I think that kind of gets to this next slide too, is, you know, from, from the auditor, what are we going to do to make sure that this doesn't happen again? Um, so kind of as a result of this reissuance, you know, we're, we've already gone back and looked at our procedures and our processes for testing these balances. Um, so we've already identified ways we need to improve our methodology related to testing these balances uh, and just take a, you know, a closer look on all the inputs that are running through this calculation. Um, so we're going to be implementing those changes uh, going forward. Uh, also, we have a independent quality control review that happens for our audits. Um, so we're going to also increase the whoever gets assigned to do the quality control next year will uh, have to increase their review procedures uh, related to the audit um, and obviously specifically related to the OPEB disclosures and calculations. So, so internally, you know, we're going to be looking to add additional procedures and review processes on our end to ensure that, you know, this error does not continue going forward and there's not some uh, input error in some other area of this calculation going forward. So, so from that standpoint, we are going to be taking a, a closer look at these calculations, both pension and OPEB as, as they are both very sensitive to uh, any kind of changes in estimates or inputs uh, can have a significant impact. So, so we're really going to be looking at those a lot higher. Those are, going to turn into a more of a higher risk audit area from an audit standpoint, which requires us to uh, test in, in greater detail. If we can flip to the next slide. And then from a communication standpoint, um, since we are having to reissue the financial statements, there are certain communications that we'll have to have updated. Um, so we will be sending um, a, a new representation letter to management. Uh, basically, just stating that they're not aware of any other um, errors or uh, in the financial statements themselves, and that you know this audit report has only been adjusted for the correction of this error. So we'll be sending that over to Jennifer and her group um, for their signature, and then also, we, as previously mentioned, we will be including the uh, material weakness uh, within the financial statements, and it will also be included in our communication letter to governance. So those are just a few of the required communications we have. And so I think your that, presentation. Yes, that is the end of my presentation. Uh, okay. Happy to answer before, any other questions. Sure. Before we uh, go any further, I just want to recognize that Trustee David Vote has been on the call since the beginning of the meeting. Welcome, Trustee Vote. Do you have any questions, sir? I do. Um, and I, I missed the first part of this, and it was wondering if this is going to make any impact on the uh, projected savings to the district. Okay, David. Um, uh, Jennifer, I don't know if that's a question you want to take. Um, so in my slides, I was going to go through how this uh, changes the actual financial results. Um, okay. But I think I could use clarification when you re re reference savings to the district. Uh, uh, in our uh, upcoming uh, move to have the uh, I, I can't remember what we're calling the the uh, uh, inducement to to. Uh, Oh, that you're talking about the separation incentive plan. 
Yes. yes. No, this will have no effect on that. Okay. This will, this will be unrelated to that. All right. Yeah, and I would also mention, um, you know, this reissuance, you know, it shouldn't have an impact, you know, from a grantor standpoint either. Um, you know, in my experience, I've never had a restatement or a prior period adjustment, a reissuance of a financial statement affect uh, an, an organization's ability to receive funding from granting agencies, uh, nor have I ever seen a reissuance cause any type of change in bond rating. Um, so, again, most of these agencies appreciate the fact that, you know, management and organization is doing what is required to make sure that the financial statements is correct and accurate as it can. Um, so, in, in my experience, I, I've never seen a reissuance or a restatement have really a negative impact uh, from outside parties looking back at an organization. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Trustee Vote, Trustee Ayers Wilson. Uh, Greg, is that the end of your presentation? Uh, yes, sir. That's the end of my presentation. Okay. Doesn't sound like there are any other questions. Any other questions from the trustees? If not, we'll let Jennifer proceed with our presentation. Okay, Ms. Mott, floor is yours. Okay, thank you. Um, okay, link is All right, hold on. Link, you switched me to presenter. Oh, so I need I'm sorry, so I need to have the slides open, right? And share my screen. Go. All right. Okay, we can see it. Okay, great, thank you. Yes, ma'am. Switching so I can still see you guys. Okay, so yes, yeah, so this is, I took the presentation that I presented uh, back in, was it end of November, early December? Um, I took that presentation that I had given then and I updated it because right the the auditors they report on their review of the financials about the the representation of the accuracy of the financials right what they what they don't do is make comments on whether the financial results themselves are you know healthy not healthy that sort of thing so uh, I do each year when presenting the financial report, kind of give the summary of, okay, these, this statement is correct. Now, what do, what does some of this mean? Uh, so I wanted to update that and how this affects our financial position. Um, so I'll go through some of the, the key reports. I do want to mention here that for our reporting, we are considered a special purpose government engaged in business type activities, and that does affect how we are required to report. Um, and so first, of course, covering the reissuance itself, this is the, the finding that Greg mentioned, material weakness in internal control over financial reporting. And this is the planned corrective actions that we have, which are really already implemented. So first is to make sure that we did receive additional guidance and training on GASB 75. Uh, but that second bullet is what was already referenced is um, having our own workbook to do these calculations. And so we do have that. Uh, we ha had actually already built it when initially putting out the financial statements, uh, because as mentioned, this was the first year we needed to do that full calculation ourselves. Uh, part of what happened there is to check it. We ran 2019 numbers through it to see if we came to the same result as that prior year, and we did. So that's when we thought that that workbook was calculating correctly. Uh, but of course, as Greg also mentioned, this layering amortization, FY20 was the first year that that layering amortization needed to occur. So since that was not an element needed in 2019, us doing that backwards check on the workbook didn't catch that piece for us. So that's where that calculation went awry in this workbook that we built for this year. So of course now discovering this error, 
We have now corrected that in the workbook. So from here on going forward, we do have now our own workbook that does these calculations. And then just in a broader sense, making sure we are getting ourselves more training opportunities and information on implementing new GASB requirements, right? Because that is at the end of the day, sort of what tripped us up here is implementing these new GASB requirements. So that is the corrective actions that we, ha we have already implemented and will continue to do in terms of the making sure we get plenty of training opportunities and knowledge on GASB requirements. So then now is when I just wanted to change to how does this actually change the financial results themselves? Uh, this is just a quick summary of, right? The financial statements have three key statements, the balance sheet, income statement, and the statement of cash flows, right? And the balance sheet, right? That is a snapshot in time at the beginning and end of the fiscal year with the income statements and cash flow statements being the reports on the activity that occurs between those two Dates, those two snapshots in time. So for fiscal year 20, uh, we started the year with a net position of 218 million and we ended the year. Now that the new number is 222 million. So this is where I'm trying to show what the original, what I originally reported was versus now the reissued figures. Um, so this is where instead of what we thought was a negative $80 million uh, net income, reducing our net position, we instead have a positive 4 million net income. So our net position did increase from 218 million to 222 million. And if you have questions along the way, please just uh, uh, pipe in here. Uh, and then just digging in a bit deeper onto the income statement itself, right? I am trying to show, I, I used uh, the, the line through the numbers to show what were the numbers that I previously presented back in the fall versus what are the reissued figures. And this is where I'm showing that on the income statement, uh, this correction occurs in the operating expenses. Um, and so, and here, just to note here as well, Right, so as a um, special purpose government uh, operating as a business type activity, this is where our, our property tax revenues and our state appropriations, right? Those get reported as non-operating revenues, right? Because as a business type activity, typically a private business would not be receiving those types of revenues. So what's in the operating revenues line, that's really tuition and fees, that's what we would be getting if we were operating as a private business. So I, I do want to make sure I make that note. So that's clear. Um, but yeah, really where the effect of this is, is in our operating expenses, which then changes that net income uh, to be a positive uh, 3.9 million net income. Before you leave this slide, could I ask a question, please, ma'am? Sure. Okay, thank you. And, and I, apologize for not remembering but were we when this was last presented to the full board did the full board ever see that there was a potential 79.1 million dollar loss uh we did i don't believe we ended up going through my slides the presentation with the full board like we did with the committee but i did uh make sure every everyone on the board got a copy of the financial report. Okay. I, I think what I'm what I'm trying to ask is if we had seen this number before or if this number is inserted now based on the new information that you have. The 79 million the sub Yes. The 79 million. Now that is not inserted here. That was on these slides and it was in the financial report that was provided back in December. Okay. Sounds yeah, good. So that's the number that was there in the in the first issuance of the mm -hmm. financial report. That's the number that was there. And now in the reissuance, the number that's there is the 3.9 million. All right. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So this next slide I won't spend a ton of time on because here 
again, like it's been mentioned, this is a non-cash impact. So on, in this respect, the cash flow statement, there is no change in any of these figures. Uh, same thing here, again, drilling the, the slide showing additional detail on the cash flow statement. There is no impact of this reissuance on these figures here either. And then finally, getting to the balance, balance sheet itself, some of the di additional details there, right? I mentioned that this does impact our net position. Our net position uh, went from 218 million to 222 million, an improvement of 4 million. And so that changed. This slide just shows then the uh, different components within net position. And so all of this affects the unrestricted net position aspect. So that's where that change comes in here. Okay. Could you walk us through the unrestricted line item and then the effect it has on the net position, even though they're both there, I'd like to have a little bit of a layman's explanation, please. So the unrestricted, sure. So the net position, the net position is really the, the difference of assets minus liabilities, right? Um, and then from there, we have to calculate the how much we've invested in capital assets, and then of course how much we have in restricted assets, um, and that go goes there. And so then, honestly, the unrestricted net position becomes a it does become a back into number because all of those other numbers we have, and so it's what is left over. So in our case, net position is. Uh, positive, right? Positive 222 million that our assets exceeds our liabilities. But a lot of our assets are in capital assets. So we have 300. So in 2020, we, we had a net investment in capital assets of 342 million. So just what, what this means is that a lot of our assets are in our facilities, right? In our capital assets that we have, um, so in that sense, it's just, it's less liquid in that sense. Um, but so that's how you kind of get to the different components of the net position. Okay, so I understand backing into where, the number. Mm -hmm. uh, pardon me, I understand backing into the number, uh, but I, could you give me an example on what, what might be included in unrestricted? Um, I mean, so some of our cash would be included in unrestricted, right? Our our cash reserves, for example, would be part of that. Um, but in this case, because we have such a large um, balance in our capital assets, yes, we we do have a negative unrestricted net position. Okay, is it desirable to have a negative unrestricted position or undesirable? Um, I mean, it's definitely not desirable. Um, when you, you can see over here in the history that I've included, um, we were, um, the last time we had a positive um, unrestricted net position was 2014. And the reason that's a key date is 2015 is the first year that GASB 68 became effective, which was when we had to report the pension liability for the first time. Um, and then, um, and then 2018, so you can see the next time there's a large change in the unrestricted net position, 2018 is when we had to first implement GASB 75, which is the first time ever that we had to report this other post uh, employment benefit liability. So adding these two liabilities onto our books in 2015 and then in 2018, right, adding that much to our liabilities is really what brought our unrestricted net position negative, as you can see from that history. Okay, um, so we cannot control OPEB liabilities, right? Right. Okay, so we're, we're stuck with whatever that liability is going forward. But looking at two, four, five, six years of red numbers is concerning. Is this a trend that you anticipate continues or how do we, how do we make those numbers go from red to black? Um, 
I mean, that one, I'm going to say it's a little bit of a tricky one because uh, as Lone Star College, we prioritize our facilities and the quality of our facilities. So, especially right now, as we are continuing our bond program, we are putting in significant investment into our capital assets. So, right, we've issued the bonds and that came in as cash. And as we use that cash to build new facilities, um, in that sense, probably I, I would not see this trend reversing in the near future, but primarily because we're continuing to invest in our capital assets. Um, so really to offset this trend, we would we would need to increase significantly our our cash reserves to offset that trend. Um, but like I said, I mean, even in conversations with rating agencies, uh, this has not been, they understand the impacts of adding the pension liabilities and the OPEB liabilities onto our books. So increasing our cash reserves beyond that 20% goal that we've talked about has not, um, that has not been mentioned as a recommendation for anybody. But I mean, to reverse the trend, that's where it would have to be. Okay, thank you. Sorry, Jennifer, to just dominate the um, conversation. Greg, go ahead, and then I want to. Uh, Jennifer, I was just going to contribute here and say that you know most of the community colleges that we audit, most of the governments that I audit, um, because of the implementation of sixty-eight seventy-five, their unrestricted net position has turned negative. Um, so that's this is not uncommon to see a negative unrestricted balance. Um, most governmental entities are in that position. Um, and a lot of it has to do because of the post employment benefit plans are not fully funded. Uh, so they have a very large impact uh, to, to your overall net position. Uh, I've seen some instances, you know, for internal analysis where, you know, it's ideal to, to back out the effects of your pension and OPEB when looking at your unrestricted um, to see what that true number is, because they do get skewed uh, pretty significantly when you factor in the effects of your pension and OPEB. Okay, thanks, Greg. Um, Trustee Vote or Ayers Wilson, do you have any questions before we go to the next slide? No, I, I don't see. I don't see anything. Okay. Uh, thank you, Jennifer. Proceed, please. Thank you. Uh, this is actually my last slide. Okay. Right. Yes. Yeah, I'm sorry. I'm I'm sorry to interrupt. I did have a question. I was on mute. Yes, ma'am. Go ahead. Um, Jennifer, um, when trustee Sullivan asked, did you notify the board, um, at the meeting and you said you just sent out the email of the revised, is that what you said? So the, no, and so in the fall, when we first put out the financial report, um, we, we had this sort of similar meeting and presentation with the audit committee and then a board agenda item goes in front of the board and we make sure every board member receives a copy of the financial report. So that's when they would have received it in the fall. Uh, we will now do the same thing uh, for the board at the, the June board meeting. Um, wanted to get this committee the report first and this presentation. Um, and then after that, uh, probably you know later today or tomorrow is when I will send out a copy of the financial report to the full board. And then the full board can, can consider this item at the June 3rd board meeting. Okay, I was just wondering because you know when you send out, let, let's say you sent you talk to the um, the committee and then you just send the email to the board or it goes to the board. But you you have we have to make sure that the board knows about all changes, um, good or bad. You know what I'm saying? And and so they can have a informed and a, be able to make an informed decision based on the new information that's changing. You know what I'm saying? So I just yeah. want to make sure we we make a note that if I don't care if it's positive or negative, I think when it's presented to the board, it needs to be noted that this changed from this to that. So you know people can have a fair um, option to make a decision. Yes. Yeah, so there is um, for the the June board meeting, there is going to be there is an agenda item that would be for the board to to review this financial report and vote to adopt it. Okay, and will will the change also be noted at the board meeting? I mean, the 83 million overstatement, is that gonna be included like with that agenda item or is that something that, you know what I'm saying? How is that gonna be 
for for yeah, all the no, members I, of the board to know. I certainly, I certainly can note note that. Um, and and you know, if if desired, I can do maybe even a shortened version of this presentation at the June board meeting, so the full board sees that if that's something yeah. desired. Yeah, it, I mean, just just as you know, I'm new. You know what I'm saying? So when stuff like this is to me, like I said, that we want to make sure this doesn't happen again, but we want to also make sure that every trustee on that board knows what's going on, you know what I'm saying? And so they can make an informed decision because they'll have all the information and not just some information or not where, oh, it was emailed or we were sent the revised. But when you send a revised, you, you want to make sure that you're detailing what you're revising so they can know to go look at that revised. Thank you. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, let me let me jump in if I may, Jennifer. Before you, uh, I know that you said that's your sl last slide. Um, Trustee Harris Wilson, I, I assure you, will make sure that the administration notifies all the trustees of the change prior to um, the board meeting. And I agree with you; it's a good idea to do it. And to give you a little background on this, and this is not to um, to divert any responsibility of oversight of this, but I. I was screaming, screaming about OPED liabilities uh, when I joined the board and sat in on my first audit committee meeting. And the audit committee <laughs> at that time was myself as chair, David Vogt, and former trustee Ken Lloyd. And I, I raised such a stink about it that we ran well past our meeting time and the board was waiting on us to adjourn so they could begin the board meeting and former trustee Smith, Alton Smith, chairman at the time, even came in and said, are y'all going to wrap up or not? And I was still beating on Jennifer about OPEP liabilities. So it was new to me. Red numbers alarm me as much as they do you and others. And um, we've, we've heard you loud and clear, and we'll make sure that there's a, a, a prominent message to the trustees. Does that sound okay? That's fair. I, I just think that brings for better accountability and transparency. Yeah, I agree with you completely. And um, we're, we heard you loud and clear and, and we'll make sure that happens. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Thank you for the input. Uh, uh, David, do you have any input? Yeah, well, I wanted to ask a question. Uh, with our new policy regarding uh, board uh, attendance at committee meetings, was was the board the rest of the board notified of this meeting well they they were and looking at the participant list ernestine's on the call as well as miriam so we asked for public comment earlier there was none but i do see that they are on the meeting with us and hearing us as we speak okay good good thank you anything else thank you. certainly good good input we want the committee to be active absolutely so that looks like Jennifer's next slide. Go ahead, Jennifer. I think we just did this slide with questions, but <laughs> okay. certainly if there's any further questions. Okay, um, hearing no further questions from trustees, is there any additional comment from uh, Jennifer or Greg that y'all want to add before we go to the next agenda item? No, other than again, thank you for everyone's time this afternoon. <laughs> Um, obviously, recognizing the size of this, we knew we needed to get this reissuance out. Um, so I, I appreciate everyone's time allowing us to do this and get it out. Okay, well, we appreciate the presentation. Hearing no further questions, I'm going to ask for a motion from the uh, from committee members to accept the AFR, the annual financial report, and the updated independent auditors reports would uh, either trustee Ayers Wilson or trustee vote like to make a motion. We need to and reason we're doing this is we have to vote it out to get it to the um, full board for a vote. Uh, I make the motion. Okay, thank you trustee vote. Uh, Ms. Ayers Wilson, if you're interested in making a second, please feel free. If not, I'll certainly second it. That's the second. Okay, thank you. So we have a motion by trustee vote, a second by trustee Ayers Wilson. Um, all in favor? Uh, Aye. Well, let me, let me, I'm sorry. I should have asked for a discussion. Oh, sorry. <laughs> yeah. No, 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 no. That, that's my fault. Any discussion now that we have a motion and a second? 
Uh, hearing no discussion, now let's take a vote. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Thank you. Uh, there are no nays. All three trustees present on the committee voted to accept the item. And there are no, uh, let's see, we have one other. Uh, first of all, thank you all both uh, very much for your participation. The next agenda item is suggested future agenda items. Uh, do either of the uh, trustees uh, vote or Ayers Wilson have a suggested future agenda item? Not at this time, I don't. Okie dokie. Thank you, Trustee Ayers. Trustee vote. Well, I thought of a question instead of an item for the agenda. Uh, yes, sir. This uh, this error came because they made a, a change in in how how the, that one item was. was entered into from one from one year to the next was entered into the into the overall calculation is am I understanding that right I'm going to ask Jennifer to answer if you don't mind trustee vote yes sure thank you no so the um it wasn't really a change it was part of the original GASB 78 um 75 getting my number wrong um guidance that was implemented in 2018 where new layers needed to be amortized what happened in 2020 was that 2020 was the first year that there was layers amortization. Being amortized right so the first time going through it in 2018 and then in 2019 it was a brand new layer so there was nothing there was not layers yet to be amortized so 2020 was the first time that that aspect of the new rule had an impact on how the calculation was conducted. Are there are there any other um, other things that might change? And might uh, you know there was a long discussion about how sensitive the calculations were to the input of the. Yeah. No, I mean, so obviously in finding this error, that is where both us and the auditors went through the calculations again to review those. So there are, there is nothing else that we know of. Certainly if we did, we would make sure that is included, but that is why I had that other piece of the, our corrective action plan is to make sure we get more training and guidance on GASB 75, and then any other new GASB rules as they come out, make sure we increase our training and knowledge of and new new rules, new guidance that comes out. So, so the guys that are that are making all these changes have got to step up their game in order to keep us confused. <laughs> yeah. 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 Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, trustee vote. Uh, trustee Ayers Wilson, anything before we adjourn the meeting? No, I'm good. Okay, thank y'all both very much. So we've had the motion, it's been approved. I've asked for input on future agenda items. There are no future agenda items suggested by the trustees. So with that said, I will adjourn the meeting. Thank everyone for attending. Appreciate the input. Thank you, Jennifer. Thank you, Greg. Thank you, trustees. All right. Thank you. Y'all have a good day. Thank you. Well. thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Link, thanks for helping us out with the audio and